Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time talking episode one of season five of Arrow Legacy. So once again, Arrow is back. And um, as per usual, it's been several months since uh, the last time we saw our heroes. And uh, this is to find uh, everybody on Team Arrow in very interesting places. Oliver is seriously in denial that uh, everybody else has moved on with his life. He's sort of really just blowing off his responsibilities as mayor. It, I mean, this really, it, it really does sort of feel like what would have happened if Bruce Wayne had got elected mayor of Gotham City, particularly in those interpretations of Batman where, you know, he's extremely, like, he's always, like, refuses, like, if Alfred brings him food, he'll just sit there and let the food get cold and won't even touch it because he's so busy staring at the bat computer and stuff. You know, that's always annoying me. It's sort of like, okay, look, Batman, I'm pretty sure you can spare the brain power to eat a sandwich. But anyway, um, Dig has, uh, from what little we see of him in this episode, it looks like he's rejoined the military. Thea seems to have really found a groove that she's happy in, being happy in being part of uh, Oliver's political entourage. Felicity is, of course, still doing, uh, doing her Overwatch thing. Um... I wonder if she's still, you know, sort of a business lady, too. It's a little unclear, but I guess we'll probably get uh, that expanded on. It still kind of cracks me up that her name is Overwatch. I mean, I understand why they went with, um, they, they opted not to use Oracle, just probably because of um, rights issues and such. Uh, but still, having that name, uh, and then, of course, having an incredibly popular video game out there currently with the name of Overwatch does seem a little bit funny, but... You know, that's kind of how life goes. Um, let's see. So, so, it, so it is a very interesting place where everybody finds themselves. It is um, interesting to see just how seriously Oliver is just deluding himself. It's like, no, no, this is all just a temporary thing, even though everybody around him is telling him, like, Oliver, this is not a temporary thing. But, uh, you know, Oliver Queen does what Oliver Queen wants to do, right? <clears throat> now, I just um, want to kind of... Oh, yeah, it, it was kind of fun seeing uh, Anarchy again, uh, even though, uh, though it was a brief, uh, a brief appearance. Um, it's just kind of a nice way to remind him, like, oh, hey, Lonnie Machen's out there. He's a bad guy. He likes to blow up stuff. And uh, I have a feeling we'll, of course, be seeing him again on the uh, Dallas Sleep. I'm still not too happy with him for, you know, killing her boyfriend from last season. Uh, uh, speaking of bad guys, we're introduced to a fellow by the name of Anton Church, who seems like he's going to be a pretty significant player um, uh, in, in uh, what's going to be going on here. Now, if I don't believe this is a character from the comics, or if he is, uh, he's not anybody that I know about. He is uh, very quickly shown to be... Pretty smart guy, extremely ruthless, and um, kind of somebody who sort of feels like he could be a season one character. And so far, with what we've seen here in season five so far, it really does feel in a lot of ways like a return to season one, particularly in the regards to Oliver and his policy on killing. I mean, we even have that really nice little nod back to the very first episode with no one can know my secret, followed by somebody getting their neck broken. Never mind Oliver killing two guys with a gun uh, later on in the episode. Um, but of course, uh, a lot has changed then, and Thea uh, ultimately is the one who really seriously calls him out on this, saying, like, look, I definitely, I don't want to be a part of this again, and I certainly don't want to be a part of this again. If you're going to put killing back on the table, like in season two, when Oliver killed the original Count Vertigo, it was in one of those situations where he really didn't have a whole lot of choice, but him choosing to take a life at that point was kind of a big deal. And it's a, it is interesting. Oliver is in this weird place where he's both deluding himself and in a lot of ways kind of backsliding in, um, into who he used to be, while everyone else is uh, trying to go on with their life. You know, it sort of makes that uh, the whole proverb of, you know, the shark that stops swimming drowns. Always move forward. Always forward, never back. Seem uh, a very, very fitting thing to put in this episode. Um, 
also nothing really particularly huge to say about what's going on uh, with the flashbacks. Um, definitely going to be interesting uh, to see what's going to be happening when we finally get the real story on uh, Oliver having become a captain in the plot, uh, which was always one of those things that's like, back in season one, it's like, how in the world did that happen? Well, now we're finally going to get the answers to that. Uh, I guess uh, maybe that uh, whole thing with flashback is maybe resonating with you a little bit, because I'm actually reading a book right now uh, that's actually set in Russia. Uh, 1636, uh, The Kremlin Games, uh, if anybody's interested. Great book, I love it. It's like the fourth or fifth time I've read it. Uh, but anyway, and of course it's uh, great to see Anatoly back, because he was a cool guy back in, what was that, season two? Jeez. Yeah, season two. Time flies. Uh, anyway, so let's see, what else do we have going on here in this episode? Um, Quentin Lance, uh, speaking of backsliding, is uh, spending a little too much time with uh, his, his bottled friends, but uh, this episode uh, does seem to be the start of him kind of pulling his head out of his butt and getting back up on uh, the bandwagon again. Um, so we'll see how that all plays out. It was certainly very moving to see that uh, ceremony with uh, Laurel and uh, you know, what, Al Oliver's talking about that. And he also kind of goes on like, yeah, some people might question the, the wisdom of putting up a statue like this. When you've got all this stuff going on, could the money be spent elsewhere? Um, yeah, it's also a statue of my ex-girlfriend, which um, thank you, media, for not bringing up at all. Speaking of which, did you see that? Did you notice in that scene? Well, all this is going on. There's this kid. Uh, I guess one of the extras. The entire time is not paying the least little bit of attention to Oliver, and looks like he's. It looks like he's playing with a little bit of rope or something. I can't tell exactly what he has in his hands, and it has absolutely no bearing on the story whatsoever. I just happened to notice this. I'm like, okay, this kid is on a TV show, and. He's choosing to mess around with, like, string or something. I mean, seriously, go back and watch it, and you'll see this kid. It's kind of unintentionally hilarious. Um, so, the statue of Laurel, what is up with the face on that statue? It looks just a little, little bit off. I, I, I look at that, I can't help but think of this uh, statue we have in the town where I, I currently live uh, in, in Illinois, and there's a statue, this hand, this hand carved wooden statue of Abraham Lincoln with a head that is way too small for the body. I mean, it's not a bad looking statue, it's just like, why is the statue's head so damn small? So, yeah, uh, let's see, what else do we want to talk about? Um, oh, yeah, some nice little comic book Easter eggs. We see a, uh, a sketch of uh, Vigilante, which may be one of the main characters introduced to the season, done by uh, George Perez. And then uh, the uh, actual sketch of Green Arrow that uh, Church holds up for his goons, done by uh, Neil Adams, a uh, very revered comic artist with uh, more than a little bit of Green Arrow experience under his belt along with uh, a great many, many other iconic characters. I mean, uh, if you're a fan of comics, uh, you know that uh, Neil Adams is uh, the man's a legend. And George Perez, oh, dude, I am so, so psyched. Uh, but we got something from George Perez on, this, uh, on the show. He's probably my favorite artist in, in, in all of the comics. I absolutely love George Perez. He is great, and the man, the guy's attention to detail is just mind-boggling. And of course, he's one of the guys who uh, was known for stuff like uh, Teen Titans back in the 80s. Uh, if you really want to read, uh, of course, also the artist on the legendary Crisis on Infinite Earths, and if you really want to read some good stuff, go and read um, the the Justice League Avengers crossover from years back. It is just unfathomable uh, how amazing the art on that is, and uh, and the story itself is also also quite good. 
Uh, I don't want to spoil it for you, but man, oh man, are there some just absolutely fantastic, fantastic uh, moments in that story. It's gold. Uh, let's see. What else do we need to talk about? Um, oh, yeah. Um, so we're also introduced this episode. We only see him briefly to Wild Dog. Now, this is a character I don't really know a whole lot about. In fact, uh, oddly enough, uh, the, the, the thing that I know mostly about Wild Dog uh, comes from from a thing I read years ago in, like, Wizard Magazine. You know, I'm older than I look. So back in the day, uh, back when magazines were actually still a reasonably good source of new information about what was going on in the comics industry, uh, Wizard was kind of the magazine that all the comic book fans read. And every month they would have this thing called the Mort of the Month. And this, a Mort was basically like a character who was so dumb and so stupid, they basically deserved to die. And Wild Dog was put in there one issue, one issue, and um, he just sort of sounded like a really lame knockoff of the publisher. And it was a little hard to take a guy with a cartoon dog on a, on a sweatshirt as part of his costume very seriously. But the funny thing is, uh, several of those sort of characters, like Rainbow Raider, who we've seen on Flash, and Bucky from the Captain America comics, have since come back to the comics been had gotten interpretations that have been really well received among fans, particularly Bucky. So um, it just goes to show you that um, there is probably some credence to the idea that there's no such things as bad characters, so much as that uh, every character is simply looking for the right writer to really make them shine. But uh, I suppose that's a philosophical thing. Uh, but anyway. Um, Interesting. I'm interested to see what it is they're they're going to do with Wild Dog uh, here on the show. I know they recently brought him back in the Green Arrow comics, uh, but I haven't read any of those comics, so I don't really have anything to say about that. Although bringing him about back was doubtlessly in a response to what's going to be happening with the character on Arrow. But uh, I'm I'm confident they're going to give us an interpretation of this character that's going to be very interesting and well worth watching. Um, we also do sort of get reminded that Evelyn Sharp uh, is still out there. Um, we also very briefly get a look at uh, the season's big man, who's going to be Prometheus. Um, I know he's got some serious history in the comics with Green Arrow, although when it comes to Prometheus, I generally tend to remember him mostly from uh, the original story where he was introduced back in the Justice League comics. Uh, Grant Morrison and uh, Howard Porter did that story. Uh, good story. And he was basically kind of painted as sort of like the Batman of evil, you know, the son of some criminals who were gunned down by the cops and he dedicated himself to um, learning how to sort of basically grow up and be like the ultimate hero killing bad guy. And um, it's, it's a really good story. And uh, the way he ultimately gets defeated by Batman is both brilliant and hilarious at the same time. Uh, let's see, what else do we have to say? Uh, the whole plot with um, the corruption in the, sea, in the Star City PD, eh, yeah, I'm not really super excited about that. But you know, it kind of gives, gives Quentin something to play around with. Um, now the whole thing with Laurel and uh, her Request to Oliver, don't let me be the last canary. Well, I mean, Sarah's white canary, so she's not. Now, whether or not she was referring to, like, the last black canary, well, this is obviously going to be something that's going to be coming into play later on, and uh, we've been hearing uh, that uh, the network definitely does have plans for Katie Cassidy, uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Let's see. Um, nothing particularly huge to say about what's going on with Curtis this episode. Just his insistence after he gets his butt kicked by those muggers that, hey, uh, I want to be a part of, like an active part of whatever's going on. Okay. It's not the most riveting motivation ever, but um, okay. 
getting your butt kicked by mothers, that's certainly an, uh, a good reason to want to learn to take care of yourself better. And, you know, having Curtis get out there and sort of be out there, action in the field, Felicity, that definitely has a lot of promise. Um, let's see. No, uh, I don't really have uh, too much else to say. Um, although one thing I do like, though, is this episode where they um, they kidnap Oliver, and they talk about like this episode, like Oliver's rating popular with people in the, is in the basement, but then after everything that goes down, he's suddenly super popular. I think part of it is probably because if you watch that scene carefully, Oliver can be seen like actually punching out, like actually decking at least one of the bad guys. And you have to figure that probably made into the news. I mean, can you imagine stories about like the mayor of some town, like punching some bad guys who were trying to attack him? I mean, that would basically just kind of be like a real life version of that old um, Harrison Ford movie, Air Force One, which, if you've never seen it, is one a pretty good action movie. But it's sort of basically terrorists hijack Air Force One, and the president has to kind of go and do the whole John McClane thing to take them down. So the president of the United States is a literal action movie hero. Um, it's, I mean, it's a dumb old action movie, but it's uh, surprisingly a lot of fun. Um, let's see, what else, what else? No, uh, I do think uh, that kind of covers everything that I had to say about this episode. Again, it's another one of those, we've got to spend most of our time setting things up. Episodes, which are never the most fun to watch, but they are necessary, particularly when it comes to season premieres. Uh, nonetheless, there's a lot of good stuff going on here in this episode. Definitely a lot of interesting things are going to be happening. And I have every confidence this is going to be another really, really good episode. I'm sorry, another good season of Arrow. And uh, I think we've got tons to look forward to. So, with that said, folks, I'm going to call it here. As always, please comment, rate, subscribe. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Hoover Jedi. And until next time, please take care and have a good one.